Okay. All right, so we'll continue to talk about trauma involving the hip. Uh, Robert, why don't you take this one? Sure, so this says fall with left hip pain. <laughs> There's that. Oops. There, there are a few more. Gotcha. It does look like there's some edema in that left uh, parasymphysial pubic ramus area in the anterior acetabulum. Yeah. Yeah. And then here's another uh, coronal stir sequence through that area. What do you see on that one? That one, it looks like there's some edema in the adjacent musculature. Yeah. Uh, so when you get uh, fractures of the pelvic rim like this, you can often get hemorrhage into the adjacent soft tissue, but sometimes this could also be tears of the muscles there. So mm -hmm. sometimes you have to look at it and distinguish that. This is just a blow up of that injury, so, so showing a, a fracture with an obturator externus uh, tear. Here are just other examples of muscle tears. Uh, which we could see in patients who came in with uh, hip pain. Okay. Uh, uh, Tayson. Left hip pain after injury. Uh, See some fluid <laughs> around the uh, alterator externus there. Yeah, right along here. Good. Another alterator externus tear. Eliora. Okay, 27 year old MLB. Uh, right handed pitcher. Right handed pitcher. Okay, felt a tear. <clears throat> So this is a case where a marker is is helpful. Uh, the marker would be placed about over here. Oh, okay. So it looks like in the uh, lateral left lateral abdominal wall muscles, right. there's maybe a tear. Uh, one of the oblique muscles, I would think. Yeah. Good. And a couple of more images here. We can see the fluid surrounding the tear and the rib at that location. And uh, here again, that's kind of the muscle coming down. And we can see the edema on the sagittal images as well. And the axial images are very helpful in these. And we can see this is an obliquus tear, which are relatively common in, uh, in baseball players, especially outfielders. That's close to the hernia situation. Yeah, um, but this is in kind of the external chest wall. So it's curved, and uh, it actually, there are a lot of other locations where they, you can get injuries as well in uh, athletes. This is kind of just shows the, the triple layer of uh, muscles involving the, the chest and abdominal walls. I'd be concerned, but the obliquus tears over here uh, are common in Major League Baseball players. They almost always occur in outfielders. Uh, they almost never occur in pitchers. Anybody want to guess as to why? And here's the inguinal ligament that John was referring to, and the tears typically occur in here. Mm. Does it have to do with shoulder mobility? Uh, well, and... Uh, um, not really, but that, that's, a, that's a good point. And then you can also see these injuries in a lot of other players. Uh, cricket is another common uh, <coughs> one. Javelin, seen it in a couple of, uh, of golfers. Uh, typically where the muscles insert on the ribs are the cartilages. Uh, we see the edema and the hemorrhage that are associated with them, and it can track around. I think I've got a slide here. The... Uh, it, it, typically, the reason it doesn't occur in pitchers, it's thought, is that the pitchers do the same repetitive motion, and they're well-trained to do it. So they throw hard, 
but they throw hard all the time. So their muscles and tendons are are well developed for that mechanism. An outfielder may throw a lot, but uh, it's pretty pretty uncommon that they have to make a throw from the outfield to home plate to try to catch a a uh, runner while they're running. And so they they can overstrain the uh, uh, abdominal wall muscles when they make a throw like that that they don't make very often, whereas pitchers make them all the time. So it's uncommon for a pitcher to get that kind of uh, tears, but quite common for an outfielder. And How about, uh, about catching the ball and stretching up and also sliding into base and that sort of stuff? That's a uh, good... Pitchers don't do that very often, do they? No, they don't. Uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, Shohei Otani, but other pitchers don't. Uh, yeah, I I haven't seen th- these kind of injuries in in base running, and it's interesting. I haven't seen them very often. In, I don't remember ever seeing one in a catcher. All the ones I've seen have really been in outfielders, and and infielders also are, are I think make the throws up to the infield. A re- repetitive enough where uh, that they don't really strain the the muscles. So this is really a common outfielder injury, but we also occasionally see it in football with the NFL players. Uh, so so it does happen. Uh, part of this is thought to be due to the throwing mechanisms, where when you accelerate, you can use the abdominal and chest wall muscles on the side of the of the throwing. And this would be baseball. This would be a, a football pitcher. I, I guess this occurs in, I mean, football uh, quarterback. But I've I've actually not seen it. Yeah, I mean, I've seen it a couple of times in 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 NFL players, but I don't remember whether it was the uh, quarterback or not. It must have been. And then you could also see this in uh, in cricket. Um, uh, 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 people, uh, well, the players, uh, they do jump and stretch their abdominal muscles mm-hmm. um, when they try to catch a ball. Uh, uh, that's going way over their head. Right. And uh, that, that uh, stretches the muscles also, don't, 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 don't they, John? Yeah, I, I don't know whether they get muscle tears from that, but they certainly could, I guess. Well, I imagine that that, that depends on how hard they stretch. Yeah. But I, 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 I have no idea because I never watched uh, baseball that much. Right. Uh, you know, for most people, it's not really important to image these because... Uh, you can make a clinical diagnosis, and the uh, uh, the people rest, and that's it. With uh, high level athletes, they want to know the extent of the injury because they they need to estimate when the when the player may go back into uh, athletic activity again. Uh, so it's it's commonly seen in athletes, and occasionally what you can see with these, though it's usually non-athletes, but you can also see rib fractures, which can produce a similar uh, symptom complex. Uh, there, the mechanism is typically more impaction injury, uh, but but uh, uh, muscle strains, I guess, could, muscle pulls could produce a rib injury, but it's usually, that's usually more from uh, uh, chest wall impaction. But there have been a couple of studies published recently looking at the value of MR, looking for rib fractures, and uh, uh, MR is really the imaging study of choice for looking for rib fractures. Okay, uh, Robert? All right, so we have a 17-year-old male two weeks after sports trauma, evaluate painful mass. It looks like there's a heterogeneous uh, collection anterior to that rectus femoris. We, yeah, again, or within the muscle itself. Uh, I'd be concerned about an intramuscular hematoma primarily. Right. Good. Tayson. All right. Abdominal wall 
and immediately after the serve. So it looks like there's a fluid collection deep to the uh, rectus abdominis musculature right there. Okay. And there's a little bit of a high signal intensity REM. <clears throat> the uh, central part of the lesion, it looks very much like the, the muscle in signal intensity. And this is very characteristic of an acute uh, uh, hematoma. Okay. You're just starting to get some uh, oxidation of the hemoglobin around the rim. And uh, here we can see the, the funny nature of the a hematoma within the rectus abdominis muscle, and here we can see it in the coronal plane as well. Okay, so go ahead. Do you pick up uh, on that T2 uh, better than T1 on this, right? Uh, usually, yes. So let's now let's talk about what are called sports hernias or athletic pubalgia, or now the preferred term is core muscle injury. Uh, <clears throat> we've talked a little bit about this before. They're typical injuries that, that occur that basically present as groin pain usually, and uh, they're around the insertion of the rectus abdominis, the thigh adductor muscles, osteitis uh, pubis, uh, it can also be remote disease, including more traditional hernias and uh, uh, neuro injury uh, to the deep inguinal canal can occur with these and lead to uh, prolonged symptoms. So, uh, let's see. Is it Tayson? Tayson, are you next? Uh, no, I think I am. Okay, go ahead. Um yeah, pointing there at the rectus abdominis. Yeah, and you can see there. a lot of edema here. Here are the neurovascular bundles on either side. And uh, yeah. Okay, uh, Robert, what do you think of this one? All right, so we have a 16-year-old son of an orthopedist with chronic right lower abdominal wall pain. Uh Hmm. Can't say that I see much definitively on these views. But, uh... Okay. Here's the right rectus abdominis muscle in the distal tendon. Here's mm -hmm. the left rectus abdominis muscle in the distal tendon. Okay. Uh, so the right side looks thickened and scarred relative to the left. So. Right. So this is a chronic tear. You know, we've seen these all, all kinds of places with tendons and ligaments. Uh, th this is a chronic <clears throat> injury with a recurrent uh, uh, re-injury to the lesion. And if you notice here, the musculotendinous junction is somewhat more distally positioned on the left, more proximal on the right, and there's actually increased length of the rectus uh, abdominis tendon here. So this is torn uh, it's uh, it was chronic. Continued to re-injure it, and it's actually stretched a little bit in the process of the of the healing. So it's incomplete healing. Uh, we can. Uh, I I I don't remember who um, answered this question for you, John. But who would you call uh, um, on a case like this uh, if the orthopedic surgeon is not able to? to tell you what, what the problem is. Uh, who's uh, well, who, who took that case? Who, who general that? surgeons, um, I recommend it uh, for, for this kind of a situation uh, quite frequently. Uh, Campbell's recommends that if uh, there's any questions about uh, uh, so-called sports uh, hernias um, have a general surgeon because they, they, they examine a lot of these uh, a lot more than orthopedic surgeons do and uh, get their advice. So Yeah, especially, uh, that, especially if they're in the area of the inguinal ring, 
or, Correct. or, or the rectus abdominis up, up higher like that. Good. Okay. I forgot who is the last person. Who's next? I think it's me. Okay. All right. NHL player with groin pain. Looking at the uh, symphysis pubis, I think there's some increased signal at the adductor aponeurosis bilaterally. Talking about here? Yeah. And a little bit of bone edema there, maybe. Here are the axial images here and the sagittal over here. Yeah, so definitely some increased signal at those adductor insertions, and we kind of see the linear signal better on the uh, sagittal image there. Okay, so this was on 11-28-2011, so that's a hockey player. And then he came back uh, uh, a few weeks later and with increasing pain. What do you see now? Yeah, it looks like he evolved his uh, adductor origin there. Yeah, so you can see. See, now it was very subtle. More Before it was more like this, and now he actually has a, a complete tear uh, with retraction. And here we can see on the axial images the tear uh, with the fluid within the tear, normal on the left, the abnormal on the right. And here we can see the tear with the retraction of the adductor tendon here on the sagittal images. Is it a tendon or a muscle, John? Uh, th I think th this was a tear at the uh, tendon bone junction. This was mostly a tendon tear, though there was some uh, associated uh, muscle injuries as well of the uh, abdominus, rectus abdominis uh, up here. But it was the primary lesion was the tendon tear off of the uh, symphysis pubis. Right. Mm -hmm. and which is a very common injury in hockey players. Well, all, all kinds of injuries are. Yeah, right, that's true. Okay, Elior. Okay, groin pain after sports. Um, we see edema on the left, in the left adductor muscles. Um, looks like maybe there's a tendon tear. Yeah, it's so retraction. This, do you know what muscle this is? Uh, is that pectineus? This is the adductor longus over here. Okay. And and that's it's in it's torn from its attachment here to these uh, uh, symphysis pubis and retracted back here, and then we can see a little bit of edema within the the muscles here, with a normal appearance on the right side. And on the axial images, we can see the muscle injuries here as well. And in fact, it's, uh, there are quite a few muscle injuries on this left side. But the principal injury again here is the uh, tear and retraction of the adductor tendon here, the adductor longus tendon here. And no, it looks like the there's plenty of tendon if you, if you need to repair it, depending yeah. on what the symptoms are. But the sooner the better. Yeah, good. Unless they're in the playoffs. Uh, we're going to see a case of a hockey player in the playoffs. I don't think this this one is it, not yet. Uh, no, but that, what, what I mean is so these hockey players are, full, like I said, they get so damn many injuries that uh, yeah. they, 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 it's like uh, boxers and or all kinds of uh, different fighting folks right. get all kinds of injuries. Yeah. Uh, so they're, uh, it's, they're, they're, they're not just one specific kind of an injury, many different kinds. Right. So I'm not telling, I'm not telling anybody anything new, I don't think. No, it's good. So I'd like to talk a little bit, we'll come back to some of this. I just want to talk a little bit about muscle tears. There are a number of grading systems. We'll go a few of them right now. This is one of the latest uh, from the, called the British classification, uh, where they grade tears uh, zero to four. 
with four being a complete uh, uh, tear, and then uh, the grade zero, one, two, and three. And the higher the grade, more or less, the longer the time is uh, uh, to be out of play before the patient, uh, the players are able to go back to active play. But of, of, but of all of these findings, uh, what's turned out to be one of the most important is the difference between a B and a C lesion here, which we see on the grade two and grade three, uh, where these grades are just have to do with the percentage of the muscle uh, involved. Uh, and that this, uh, if you see a tear of the tendon which extends into the muscle, uh, that significantly increases the amount of time the patients are out of play before they can go back. Uh, so it's really evaluating the integrity of the tendon that's important. It's easy to see the tendon outside the muscle where it attaches to the bone. That's what we've seen in the last few cases are tears of the uh, tendon bone junction. Uh, but there's another area that's uh, recently gotten more press, which is actually the intramuscular portion of the tendon. Uh, so I don't know if here, but at, at some point, uh, I think we're going to have a lecture on muscle tears themselves, and I'll show examples of what an intramuscular tendon tear is, and uh, the significance of that is that it can prolong return to play. Uh, so in this, uh, uh, another publication four years later where they used the British classification, uh, they found that most of the time, or almost half the time, they're grade one lesions, which do very well. Uh, they return to play in one to two weeks. Uh, grade two or three uh, tends to be a more four to six weeks, and if it's a grade four, it's greater than six weeks. But then more recent studies, and I don't know if I have them here or not, but we will in others, uh, show uh, that the the grade two and threes that actually go to six weeks or longer are actually those that have the intramuscular tendon tears, whereas if you just have a grade two or three and the tendon is intact from external to internal, uh, then you're on the lower side of this four to six weeks. Okay, I think Elior did the last one. Robert, what do you think of this one? Uh, here it looks again like there's a lot of edema in that adductor longus with the tear of the tendon from the traction. Right in through here, and then here we can see the edema here as well. Good. And then that's what it looks like in the axial plane. Okay. Uh, now, uh, Generally, uh, a lot of the orthopedic surgeons we work with now like to not use the term sports hernia. As John pointed out before, that was a term that made, was made popular by athletic trainers uh, due to the patient's symptoms, not due to the actual pathology that was involved. Uh, <clears throat> athletic pubalgia is uh, probably a better term, uh, but now uh, the term that uh, most people like to use is called core muscle injury, and that's injury to these these areas that we're talking about. Okay, uh, Tayson, this is a, a hockey player. All right, a former member of the Kings. I think there's some increasing on the left uh, at the muscles, right? Okay. That's the side that he was, there may be muscles, but he was symptomatic over here. And maybe there's a little bit of increased signal also at the muscular tendon, muscular, I'm sorry, the tendon bone junction here on the left side on the, on the PD fat side images. And it looks pretty nonspecific here, just a little bit of signal in that tendon where it attaches to the symphysis pubis. Yeah. Um, Okay, so this is 12 26 2006. He continued to play, and three months or four months later, three and a half months later, uh, he came in with increasing symptoms in the same area, and this is what it looked like. Yeah, it definitely looks like a tear at the symphysis. Uh, okay, this one. so and then here we can see that uh, uh, muscle, the muscle still looks like it's grossly intact. 
Um, but we can see that there is some increased signal intensity here at the junction of the bone and the tendon. Here are the coronal images. What do you think of those? Yeah, it definitely looks like a mildly displaced avulsion of that tendon. Yeah. And this is predominantly involves the adductor longus uh, tendon here, yeah, very typical. Uh, do you know the name of this sign where you see this cleft uh, with high signal intensity between the, the tendon and the bone here? So is it secondary cleft? Right. It's called the secondary cleft sign. Good. Okay. So this is now, oops, 323.07. Uh, he continued to play and came back with increasing symptoms a couple of weeks later, and this is what it looked like. Okay, so a lot more fluid and kind of displacement of that longest. Uh, yeah, so as all this hemorrhage was black and blue in this area, and you can see a displacement there. And here you can see a much bigger displacement at the bone tendon interface on 4207. Uh, so it hurt a lot at that time. So what do you think the the, the player did? Kept playing. Okay, this is for 207. We can see all this. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I messed up. Yeah, at, at this time, this is right as we, we were into uh, the playoffs. And this year, I think they went to the Stanley Cup. Here we can see all this uh, hematoma around here. And... Uh, uh, at this time, he he was not able to play uh, in the Stanley Cup playoffs because of the the injury. Okay, uh, Elior. Okay, professional hockey player rule out sports hernia. In the um, old days, he would have got a shot of. Uh... An anesthetic and uh, went back playing. I, I think before uh, uh, sports medicine became uh, prominent in sports. Between you and me, was, uh, right about the time I finished, well, start I started my residency. Yeah, between you and me, John, I think he that might have been what prolonged him playing. Okay, Elior. Um, so here, the left pubic bone, um, there's just some bone change, but I don't think, it doesn't look like there's edema. So, well, that's a T1. Uh, here's what the uh, T1. Okay. the stir image showed. Okay, on the stir, yeah, a lot of edema surrounding that pubic symphysis. Okay. And that's uh, another uh, Jason image going more anteriorly. Here are the axial images. See also the irregularity of the articular surfaces there of the symphysis pubis. And uh, this is the symphysis pubitis, the old term for it, but another cause for, uh, for core muscle injury symptoms. Mm -hmm. I wonder when they're going to get rid of that sports uh, injury uh, term. Uh, I'm not sure that it should be used. Well, now they like core muscle injury, so they've taken sports out of it. Uh, Robert. All right, so we have a professional hockey player with chronic recurrent growing pain. And let's see, on the left side, looking at the uh, pubic symphysis, there's a little bit of fluid there. Uh, I don't see any muscular edema per se. Okay. Yeah, so we can see right at the, really at the tendon bone junction, we can see a little bit of fluid there. And this was a, uh, a tear at that interface as well. <coughs> Tayson. All right. So it looks like uh, these left adductor muscles, there's a edema. Okay. The symphysis pubis looks intact without any edema. Okay. 
Well, a more anterior cut looks like there's a an avulsion of the adductor aponeurosis there. Yeah. So again, this is the adductor longus here. We can see that there is a tear uh, with a hematoma extending down. Well, that, that that's an avulsion, isn't it, John? Yes, it's an avulsion. These are these are avulsion injuries. I, I kind of like to think of that as not a tear, but avulsion. But that's, yeah, that's the, me. Okay, it, it's so yeah, it's it's a tear at the tendon bone junction. Uh, sometimes radiologists, if you say an avulsion injury, they 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 use that when you have a fracture of the bone and avulsion of a little bone fragment with it. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, there I, might be some fragments of bone there, but we don't know, do we? We don't know, definitely, that's right. Not a big fragment, but you're right. There could be small fragments, though. That residual bone there looks pretty smooth, but you're right. Okay. And notice here, whenever you see these things, you also need to comment on the rectus abdominis distally here. Uh, and you can see that that looks nice and thin. Uh, but... At its attachment down here, which is similar region to here, there probably is some uh, early separation here or avulsion of the uh, distal rectus abdominis tendon uh, where it attaches here to the periosteum and the bone. Okay, so this is 519.14. Here's 131.14. What do you think of this? Um... I think the rectus abdominis, I mean, the um, adductor injury looks almost completely healed. Uh, but is this some rectus abdominis edema that we well, see? A little bit more. This is more lateral than the usual injury here. Okay. See, maybe a little bit of increase of intensity within the distal rectus abdominis muscle. So a little bit of edema here near the in the region of the rectus abdominis insertion. And this was thought to be a strain of that distal rectus abdominis insertion. Yeah, I like that word, strain. Okay. Elior. Okay, 18-year-old female, pain one week after a fall. <clears throat> yeah, it looks like in the, are we in the joint space here, in the hip joint? Might be this, yeah, this structure there. Are you saying it's in the hip joint? I think so, yes. Okay. What do you think it is? Um, after trauma, it could be some synovial thickening or PVNS. Um, let's see. Uh, it looks one week after a fall. The adductor muscle there doesn't look good. Um, Is there a tendon injury with retraction? I'm not. I'm not sure. Yeah, this was a tear of the uh, uh, Dr. Brevis tendon, and there was retraction of the muscle. The reason I said what I said was it's not in a joint. So. Yeah, it was kind of retracted back to the joint. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Robert. Yeah, we have a 23-year-old male figure skater with pubic pain, and it looks like there's some bone marrow edema in the left inferior pubic ramus with some adjacent soft tissue edema as well. Yeah. Okay, Tayson. All right, 15-year-old soccer player. Um... Definitely have a strain of the adductor muscles on the left. I don't know if this is this diastasis of this uh, symphysis pubis as well. Yeah. 
See all the irregularity of the articulating surfaces there? So this is typically called osteitis pubis. This is actually chronic instability of the pelvis due to an injury to the, the capsule and the, the connecting soft tissue structures between the right and left side. Gives you uh, rubbing and an abnormal motion and impingement there, which leads to these erosive changes. And you can also get then hemorrhage into the adjacent muscles uh, when you get a fusion and so forth here, or even muscle tears. So that's called uh, uh, osteitis pubis. Okay, Elior. Okay, 29-year-old NBA center with right adductor pain. Um, the ultrasound here, I think we see some mus muscle fibers superficially. Um, they look irregular to the yeah, left there. It's kind of lucency in through here. Oh, there, okay. Kind of the decrease in the echogenicity. And if we do <clears throat> the MR examination, it's kind of in this area. Kind of a subtle... I see. Some edema there in the muscle. Yeah, the adductor muscle itself. Mm -hmm. uh, here are the axial PD fat sets, sagittals coming down through here. And this was an adductor strain, of uh, which uh, hampered this particular player getting close to the NBA playoffs a number of years ago. Okay, Robert. All right, so we have a 31-year-old male NHL goalie injured probably February 2013. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think so. The 22nd month. And it looks like there's a little bit of edema in that adductor longus. <laughs> yeah, some of these muscle strains, grade one muscle strains, uh, can be pretty subtle. In fact, I think uh, it's very possible to get a grade one muscle strain and have no MR findings on any of our pulse sequences. Uh, and that those all have a very good prognosis. But here we can see that adductor longus uh, muscle strain. The, the the main thing in, in, in these is to to allow them to rest so they don't complete it to a second or a third degree tear. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, I also want to point out here uh, that this is kind of a no-no that you should look out for. Here are the vessels, and notice that the flow artifact from the vessels is going right over the area of concern. In this particular case, we can clearly see that this is abnormal, uh, but th this can mask symptoms. So where you have symptoms, you always want to make sure that the phase encoding is such that you don't get phase artifact uh, overlying the area of concern. So I think this was 11-23-13. <clears throat> they then the heal, try to help heal this, did a PRP injection, and... Uh, this uh, and this was on 11 23 2013 the patient actually developed increased symptoms and came back for another mr and this is what the mr scan looked like after the prp injection it looks like there's increased edema and fluid in that region right so what do you think is going on with that uh Maybe it's related to the injection or maybe just uh, some healing changes. Right. Yeah, inflammation. So, you know, we've talked a little bit about PRP. PRP is uh, a great way for people to make money because it's the data does not show that it's definitively effective and therefore insurance companies won't pay for it. So patients have to pay out of pocket. Uh <clears throat> And if you, and a lot of people will say, well, it's great because it improves symptoms because it's anti-inflammatory. 
But the way PRP works, PRP is a concentra- spun down concentration of the platelets in the blood. Uh, those have pro-inflammatory molecules, uh, which uh, the way it's supposed to work is to increase inflammatory changes to increase the rate of healing. Uh, so the mechanism of action should actually temporarily make the patient worse because it should stimulate inflammation and stimulate the healing process. And that's probably what's happening here. Some of this could be an injection uh, from the fluid from the injection. Uh, but a lot of this is probably, in this particular case, the increased inflammatory response that you get, which is part of uh, the way PRP is supposed to work. Unfortunately, uh, that's like interfering with Mother Nature. Yeah, right. Trying to trying to help Mother Nature along, speed up Mother uh, Nature. I, I don't think that, that's. A, I never injected one of these things, so, so I. Right. I don't think it's uh, recommended very often. Well, it depends on who you go to, John. It's done an I, awful I know, lot right I, now. I, I, I know that. Yeah. Uh, a, a lot of the players would uh, run to some of their doctors uh, instead of me because I was a little more conservative. Well, what a lot of players, there are a lot of these and other things that you inject which are not FDA approved in the U.S., and that's why a lot of professional players will go to Europe to get treated uh, where they can, where there's much less control over uh, what can be injected. Uh, yeah, is, the last time yeah. I really looked at the literature on PRP, it was very mixed. Uh, almost all of the papers that showed that PRP were effective were very small papers with very few uh, people, and they were typically all done by clinics that were marketing to uh, to use the procedure and billing patients out of pocket. Most, uh, most uh, large, well-controlled clinical trials, which have been done, which there aren't very many and done in academic settings, have generally shown that PRP is not effective at changing the course of the disease. Uh, yeah, Cam- Campbell's does not recommend it. Yeah, uh, we were doing some studies at Cedars uh, to try to get better data on this uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, those studies have basically uh, stopped because they they just didn't show effectiveness. But one of the things that we did find in evaluating different PRP machines uh, that spin down and get the concentrate, the amount of the concentration of the active uh, 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 molecules in the PRP injection varied tremendously depending upon which device was used. Uh, uh, so a lot of papers out there did not control for which devices were used, and we actually found that some of the devices that supposedly gave PRP actually had lower concentration of the active pro-inflammatory molecules than just serum of the blood. So uh, uh, most of the literature out there is very poorly controlled right now. And uh, I think a lot of the initial excitement about PRP is damped down. I think everybody believes that once we understand it better, there are going to be ways to help Mother Nature improve the speed of which there's healing. But I think at this point, pretty much we we really don't understand the biochemistry well enough to know how to do it in a reliable way. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we ever get to the point where we talk about stem cells, that's the, even a worse situation. Uh, but but this uh, is PRP. I, I agree with that for sure. I, I've seen st- stem cells used uh, uh, for heart disease and... Uh, uh, and that is such just awful. Okay. Is there a like a timeline where we no longer think it's the post injection inflammation, and we're more worried about it being a progression of the original injury? Well, generally, it's thought that the uh, uh, the inflammation starts in the first week, and the inflammation should. Uh, uh, be over by six weeks. Okay. 
but again, I don't think I'm not, I'm not sure that the there are really good studies to to prove that, but that that's often what's just stated. Okay. Well, as soon as you have an injury, uh, inflammation starts, and then the first two or three days, uh, it's leukocytes and uh, 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 cells that debris the area and get rid of the dead tissue, and then after that, the healing starts. So if you start adding other stuff. To it, then you 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 start uh, problems all over again, uh, and you don't know whether the patient is going to be allergic to it or whatever. Um, so, the best thing to do in situations like this, which is all of this, this is is a strain. Leave it alone. Yeah, ice it and uh, crutches and let it heal. Okay, I don't know who's next. Tayson? All right, so it's like we have a muscle tear involving the maybe the vastus uh, lateralis and maybe the uh, medialis as well. Yeah, and hemorrhage and the septum in between there. Here's the coronal images where you can see this this is a feathery type uh, edema that you typically see in in grade one uh, muscle strains using a different grading system than the than the British ones that, that we'll go over when we talk about muscle tears and then you you look for intramuscular fluid collections which in the past has been thought to uh, de decrease the prognosis, uh, but more recent studies show that the return to play really isn't affected by whether you do or do not have intramuscular fluid at the time of the injury. So that that's uh, kind of being re reconsidered. And if you look at the British classification, they don't really use the presence of in intramuscular fluid as a major uh, uh, way to... Uh, Great, the uh, injury. Yeah. Okay, uh, Eliora. 26-year-old MLB player with thigh pain. Um, yeah, we see fluid along the muscle there. Um, yeah, I think a low-grade strain. I don't see a hematoma. Here's a T1 and T2 axials. Yeah, don't see much on the T1, but on the T2 we see um, edema there. We're in the rectus femoris. Yeah. So that's a, in the old classification, it would be a grade one rectus femoris strain. Uh, right. You know, this this is an area where you can develop uh, uh, myositis ossific cancer. So you have to be very careful about not letting this individual uh, play or be active. You have to put this patient on crutches and, and slowly increase the mobility, uh, icing it, etc. Uh, th this is a very prominent area for for myositis or civic cancer, which can become a real problem. Do you give them non-steroidals to decrease the risk? I, I Some people advise it, John. I'm not sure um, whether that's a, a good idea or a bad idea. I, I just don't have any opinion on that. Okay. And I don't think Campbell's has either. Okay. Uh, Robert, are you next? I, 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 I'm sorry to go back. I, I've I've done it uh, because I uh, for for mainly for pain relief, uh, okay. and, and maybe that did help. I don't, I I really don't know. Okay. All right. So we have right growing quite, a, quite a few cases of uh, of myositis specific cancer. Not at all uncommon in football. Okay. 
All right, so we have a looks like a pediatric patient with right growing pain, and don't know that I necessarily see anything abnormal in these radiographs. Uh, some irregularity of that. Um, uh, there's say some problem on the right side there. Yeah, I think Doctor Cruz was just pointing out some irregularity of that. It's kind of like fuzzy stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see it now. And yeah, on the MRI it looks like there's some edema in that issue of tuberosity. And right. Yeah, this is called ischial apophysitis. And this is really a traction injury to the bone from the hamstring origins. And uh, f fairly common in uh, teenage young teenage athletes uh, from overuse. So why don't we stop here and we'll continue in this same vein tomorrow. Uh, okay? Uh, have a good evening, everybody, and uh, uh, maybe it'll rain some more. We need it. We do. <laughs> I think we're, we had more rain in the last uh, month than we had all, in the last three years. <laughs> well, last year was a big year. Uh, yeah, well, let's keep it up, John. Uh, you know, this global warming stuff. Right. Okay. And uh, thank you. And then uh, just to remind everyone, I'll be gone next week. I'll remind you uh, again tomorrow. Uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, Dr. Cruz is going to be gone next week. Thank you. All right.